if you're going to make a disciple, you first of all need to establish a relationship with that person. Mm. And that relationship needs to be based on trust. One of the things that that shocked me, frankly, from the research with parents and children that we did last year, is that most kids in America no longer trust their parents. Let's talk about how a child's worldview is developed, because obviously it's developed by the things that they're exposed to, but there's so much more than that. It's more than just saying, oh, it's just the things that they see during the day. How does a child really develop their worldview? You said by the age of 13, uh, a, a child's worldview is really already established. How is that? You know, it's interesting that because discipleship is discipleship. And so whether we're talking about children or adults, are there adaptations that need to be made? Yeah. But the basic approach I've discovered through this research is the same. And so what that means is if you're going to make a disciple, you first of all need to establish a relationship with that person. Mm. And that relationship needs to be based on trust. One of the things that that shocked me, frankly, from the research with parents and children that we did last year is that most kids in America no longer trust their parents. And the reason for that is think about what kids are going through. They're trying to figure out how the world works, who they are, how they fit in it, who they're going to grow up to be, what they want to do, why it matters, what doesn't matter, all these big questions of life. So every day they're looking for clues that will answer those questions. And their natural tendency is to turn first to their parents because they live with them. Uh, their parents are constantly trying to guide them in some way, and they built some trust with them. But what most kids have discovered is when it comes to the worldview questions, the philosophy of life types of things, there's no sense paying attention to their parents. And the reason is because they hear their parents tell them one thing, but then they watch them do something different. Mm. And the way that we discovered children interpret that is, oh my gosh, my parents are as confused as I am. <laughs> well, I guess I better not pay attention to them they're going to have to try to work it out just like I'm trying to work it out. I've got to find people who have already figured it out. And that of that is why the arts and entertainment media have such powerful impact on the lives of kids. Because when they watch a 90-minute movie or a 30-minute streaming program or they listen to a three-minute song, they play a video game for 15 or 20 minutes, all the different media that they're exposed to, in those media... As we were doing our content analysis of those, one thing we discovered is that they're very consistent in the worldview that they push. Mm -hmm. And so to children, they interpret that as saying, ah, they figured out part of the secret of life. I'm going to pay attention to them because they know the answers. That's why media are so scary yeah. uh, for, for us as parents and grandparents is because they are literally reshaping the brain waves, the thinking, the thought processes, and the spiritual perspectives of our children through that quote unquote entertainment content. It's more than just entertainment. They are teaching our kids worldview. And so when you're trying to disciple a child, you got to build that trust. But part of building trust is being consistent in what you say and think and do. So if you want to be an effective discipler, know what you believe and live it consistently. But part of discipling also is what you might think of as one-on-one -on -one coaching. Our research has found that disciple making happens through one-on-one -on -one relationships. It doesn't tend to happen in groups, whether it's a, you know, a congregational meeting like a Sunday service or a small group that meets during the week. Those are fine, but they don't build disciples. It's that one-on-one -on -one relationship that builds the disciples. So mm -hmm. as a parent, you've got to think about, I am my child's spiritual coach. Mm -hmm. I am the one who has to take responsibility for that and always be evaluating, what am I trying to accomplish? How am I going to do that? How do I know whether or not it's working? We know that that means it's going to take a lot of investment of time. This isn't something you do on the fly. And that goes back to one of the mentalities 
that successful discipling parents have, according to my research, which is that they recognize as part of their core identity, number one, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Number two, I'm a parent of my child. Number three, I am the primary discipler of my child. When yeah. that's your identity, that goes a long way toward reshuffling your schedule and helping you to rethink, what am I doing right now that's important toward meeting the objectives that I've set? Now, when you're trying to disciple the child, what do you do? The same thing that everybody tries to do in discipling because it, it, it works and it's important. You go back to the Bible, you use biblical principles, you use biblical stories as well as personal stories to illustrate those principles, what they are and what they look like in practice. And then you have what I call Socratic dialogue with your child, which means you're not always telling them, do this, do that, do this. The Bible says, you know, that can only go so far before you turn the person off. Yeah. Socratic dialogue is where you're getting those principles across by the questions that you're asking the child. Mm -hmm. It's like, so what did you want to accomplish in that situation, Johnny? It's like, why did you think that was the right thing to do? How mm -hmm. did that work for you? What might have been another approach? Yeah. What do you think scripture would say about that or God would teach about that? Or are there any examples you could think of where Jesus was in a situation like that? Tell me how he handled it. I mean, it's those kinds of questions as opposed to saying, do A, B, C, you know, right. When you ask those kinds sure. of questions, and that's the, the, the foundation of that relationship, what you're doing is you're teaching your child to think biblically, mm -hmm. and that's what you want to leave with them. They can't always have you present. They can't always call you on the cell phone and say, hey, mom or dad, what should I do? I'm in this situation. It's fine if they do that, but it's not going to happen very often. What you want to do instead is to prepare them to make the right decisions, to think biblically about every situation you find them in. And then, uh, of course, as the discipler, you have to constantly be consistently modeling the things that you're trying them to embrace. So that's what we've discovered about how you're going to raise your child up to be a spiritual champion. You're the one who's got to do it. You've got to be totally focused on it. you got to go into it with a plan. It doesn't yeah. happen by default. It doesn't happen spontaneously. Plan out where you're going with your child spiritually. Homeschool Insights is sponsored by CTC Math. If you're looking for a great online math program, visit ctcmath.com and try it for free. For more great homeschool inspiration and resources, listen to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 